No, I think it's just, I don't know. You probably just have a quieter voice than me. I'm, I've got a very loud, annoying, <laughs> shrill voice. So, yeah, so you're just saying the story there about buying your daughter, your ungrateful daughter. <laughs> shit about Valentine's Day. It's Valentine's Day today, by the way, for the folks at home. Yeah, okay, well, first of all, that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what you said. You're just trying to sound good for the fans, you know? Yeah, she, what, she's uh, she's three now. And, yeah, she came into the house, and while she was in crash today, I got her a rose and a cupcake for Valentine's Day. And she came in, and I was like, oh, I have something for you in the kitchen for Valentine's Day she's like oh you know the face lit up very yeah. excited and then she came in and like I whipped out the rose and the cupcake she's like oh <laughs> what else is there <laughs> like no that, that's it oh thank you <laughs> not interested yeah, at all where's the toy where's the toy he's like there is no toy it's, it's a rose what can I do with it it's like I don't know smell it <laughs> yeah, throw it in the bin yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, hey, you and welcome. We're uh, recording now another mm. episode of the That Chapter podcast. Me and Keith, and yeah, what's going on with you, Keith? Since we recorded last week, uh, yeah, it's been a busy week. Uh, we it had has. a pancake Tuesday was yesterday. Mm, I'm not a pancake guy. Don't Are really do pancakes. Never gave a shit about pancakes. Pancakes, just not for me. You know, no, not for you. No, I'm not a pancake guy. No interest. I know it's like done, obviously it's done in Ireland and the UK. Is it it's done in anywhere else? Pancake juicy? Is, is it a thing? No idea. It shouldn't even be a thing here. Pancakes are awful and they suck. What, what's for? It's just the end of Lent, is it? Start of Lent. I oh, think. is it? Yeah. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I think Lent goes on to oh, Easter. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's probably like, I think the idea is probably it's a big feast before you like don't eat. That thing makes sense. or whatever the fuck it is. That makes sense, yeah. Who knows? Who cares? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I'm like, I, like, I'm okay with pancakes. Uh, I'm not like, I don't love them, but I had so many yesterday because, yeah. but like, but I, she's feeling a bit under the weather, but she was very excited about Pancake Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. She sh- suddenly was magically better. Well, that was, pancakes. Well, well, that was it. She was like, it's like, oh, let's make pancakes. Like, okay. So then I'm like, oh, like, start making pancakes for her. And then she take a bite. It's like, I'm not hungry. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll eat it. And then like an hour later, she'd like perk up again. Be like, mm. let's make pancakes. It's like, okay. So this happened like five or six times. <laughs> so I'm like, five or six batches of pancakes that I, I had to eat and she like ate like four bites out of yeah one. so yeah yeah i've had my fill of pancakes. You've, you've had your good fill all right very good and it was also super bowl sunday the mm. chiefs the goddamn chiefs won again mm-hmm. it's like who cares but it's it's a super i didn't not give a shit about this year's super bowl either yeah uh two times i literally could not give two shits about but you know that's what's going on in the news uh i feel like i should just browse what's going on in the in the true crime world right now keith we should do our, our current events episode where we talk about uh, ongoing shit in the uh, true crime what do you think? That's a good idea. I yeah, like that. I know, yeah. it's a great idea. Oh, we should also get like people to send us in their true crime tales. Oh yeah, that's true. We do have people sending in... By the way, I'm actually blown away by how people have sent in uh, stories for our listener stories episode. We're going to record... We're recording it like next week. I don't know when it will get out to you, but we're going to record it in about a week and a half, um, which will probably... We will have recorded it, I suppose, by the time you're listening mm. to this episode. Um, but man, I'm blown away by the amount of people who sent in episodes. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. Not this time. Uh, not approach. this time. So maybe we'll we'll do like... We'll try and make it a weekly thing then as mm. well. Like not the video episode, but just regularly recording. Yeah. Like Reese as a bonus episode, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But uh, also, yeah, yeah, we were saying it'd be cool as well if you don't have, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a ghost story or, you know what I mean? If you have like a true crime story or like, mm. uh, you know, a guy who knows a guy, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're not going to be checking facts, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we barely check facts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are idiots, but I feel like people should know that. Like, we talk about things all the time. We are just talking out of our arse most of the time. It's very true. Very, like, very true. This sounds about right, so I'm going to say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's really it. Hey, at least we're, at least we're honest about <laughs> how stupid we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Keith, uh, any ghost stories? How's the house? Uh, it's been fine. Yeah, uh, it's been it's been quiet, which has been nice. But uh, anything on your end? Because you've had a, you had you were talking about the ghostly experience uh, your wife had last. That's true. That was, that was in Budapest. But that I was in Budapest. Uh, yeah, was um, that brought home? No, unfortunately, nothing did come home with me. It's lame because I feel like everybody I know has had ghostly experiences and like mm. ghostly shit, especially other people in my family. But. And you were so close. You, you missed. You were asleep. I know. You missed it. I, I never. I personally have never. I'm so annoyed because I love ghosts and like creepy shit. I'm fascinated. I love it. I think it's really, really cool. And I'm always interested, like mad to hear stories. But I know I don't find any stories of myself. I just love mm. hearing other people's stories. So uh, no, I have nothing. Um, unfortunately, I should bring a Ouija board or something. And, like invent we should. Some That'd be some. great. Yeah. yeah. Do Do you want to do a live Ouija board episode? 
not my house, but let's do it. Yeah, I think when you're in Salem, you mentioned you wanted to do one. I did really want to do one in Salem. You mm-hmm. were you. I I think initially you were up for it, and then I think as I it got closer to date, you were like, well, I don't know anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I got too scared. Yeah. <laughs> we did. Re- we recorded actually a lot of videos in Salem. We you did. and I, yeah, uh, yeah. unreleased. Maybe I'll put them on the podcast channel. Oh, yeah, that's good. Because yeah. I had because I released one uh, video from Salem, hmm. but um, I recorded like an unreasonable amount of stuff. Like there's still some more videos I want to release on my main channel hmm. um, that will be coming up. I just I, like seriously, it's just I, don't, I fucking don't have enough. There's not enough errors in the goddamn day, and it's like I swear to God, ever I'm always like there's always something like I'm sick at the moment, so it's yeah. like, or like I'm traveling or something. Somebody's coming over and visiting. There's always something, but um, so there will be more of those travel videos coming on the channel because I record some really really cool shit. But then the other stuff, I think I might just release on the podcast hmm. channel, just as like, hey, this is us doing something. It's a good idea. Actually, you know what? That's like, I don't know. You I'm talking myself into it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what a pitch to I myself. <laughs> yeah. knock, knock that one out of the park. All right, Mikey. Give myself again. a raise. <laughs> All right, well, you know what? Let's get into today's episode. That's enough yes. uh, beating around the bush. Today, we are telling the story of Brown's Chicken Massacre. Ooh. All right, so I think for this one, how about you and I? We just, I'm doing a, let the record show. I'm doing a diving motion with my hands. I like it. Let's diving, dive right in. Diving yeah. right in. All right, let's begin. And I'm beginning now. In the early morning hours of the 9th of January, 1993, Pedro Maldonado had left his wife, Juana, and sister-in-law, Beatriz, and driven to Brown's Chicken and Pasta in Palatine, a suburb of Chicago, Illinois, looking for his big brother, who was his sister-in-law, Beatriz's husband, Guadalupe. Now, Brown's Chicken, it's still there today. Well, the same franchise, not this exact same branch, but there is still one in Palatine. Keith, did you check out the menu of Brown's Chicken? Uh, no, I actually didn't. Oh, well, guess who does the real research? <laughs> 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 I guess exactly. I looked up the menu. Uh, and we're going to read up the whole thing yeah, right now. Exactly. Uh, it's mostly fried chicken. That's, okay, that's okay. its thing, yeah. is yeah, fried yeah. chicken. Three clue, whole wings. Clues in the name. Well, actually, it's not because it does. Oh, okay. It does. Okay, so here you get three whole wings with biscuits. Comes mm-hmm. in at five seventy nine. Okay. I don't know if that's a lot or a little. But they also do sandwiches, like pulled pork sandwiches, they do chicken parm, they do Italian sausages, and they do pasta. It's kind of a weird mix. Oh, you do fried okay. chicken and then sandwiches and then Italian yeah. food. That sounds like, the name's a bit deceiving. I thought it was like a KFC style joint. It is, but then they also do pasta. And right. like burgers and sandwiches and like hot dogs, like okay. Italian sausage hot dogs. Nice. Okay. It's a bit all over the place, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. France chicken, get your shit together. It's, like, <laughs> it's a franchise anyway. There's a lot yeah, of them yeah. in probably that area. So... 47-year-old Guadalupe was the restaurant's recently hired cook, and the previous evening, he had failed to return home, having worked his shift, which ended at 9 p.m. Being 47 years old and a married father of three young boys, it wasn't like him to not return home right after work. He was a responsible guy who had moved to the States from Mexico a year earlier, specifically to try and provide a better life for himself and his sons, Juan Pablo, 13, Javier, 10, 5-year-old Salvador. Essentially, his brother Pedro was getting worried, uh, Guadalupe's wife, Beatrice, they were all getting worried. He was supposed to be finished at like nine, and this was, you know, in the wee hours uh, of the morning. And we still hadn't come home, so Pedro, he rocked up to Brown's Chicken, but the doors were all locked up. No sign of life in the place. Now, it was the middle of the night, so not surprising. At the restaurant, Pedro met Palatine PD officer Ronald Connolly, who was on patrol in the area and had seen Pedro having to go through the windows, skulking around a car park, and he thought he should probably check out what he was up to. Obviously, Pedro immediately told him about his brother not coming home, and Officer Connolly reassured him that he'd he'd do everything he could to track Guadalupe down, and Pedro should just go home and wait for his brother to come back. Connolly thought there was likely nothing wrong, but gave the restaurant a a once-over anyway and found nothing obviously odd. The only thing that gave him pause was the presence of several vehicles in the parking lot, which by that time would normally be empty. Again, this was the middle of the night. So things were a little weird. Yeah, maybe even went for a couple of pints. That's Left exactly the what they thought. Yeah, being responsible. Exactly. Yeah, hmm. listen, don't drink and drive. That's it. You heard her first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Folks, you know, uh, you probably have never heard this before, but it's not a good idea to drink and drive. <laughs> the night before, when Guadalupe should have come home and, well... He wasn't the only employee of Brown's Chicken that hadn't hadn't returned home. See, at around 11 p.m. on the 8th of January, again, so this is just, you know, the same night when Guadalupe should have come home, Manny and Epifania Castro were up a little later than usual waiting for their son Michael to get home from Brown's Chicken where he worked after school. 16-year-old Michael Castro wasn't due, you know, too late. 
The restaurant closed at 9 and the small team needed an hour or so to close. It wasn't out of the ordinary for him to go out after work with his colleagues, but Michael always called and let his parents know he was okay. But Michael hadn't called. So Manny, much like Pedro, decided to drive over to the restaurant in case Michael's truck had broken down or something and he was, he was stranded in, in need of a ride. Manny returned home shortly after with Michael still nowhere to be seen. He checked the restaurant out and found it all locked up and quiet. The only thing that seemed a little odd was the presence of several vehicles in the parking lot, including Michael's truck. Still, it was much more likely that the team had, uh, you know, had walked somewhere local for some after work socializing than anything untoward. However, the balance of that likelihood shifted way over in the wrong direction when the Castro's phone rang. On the other end was Evelyn Urgenia. Evelyn was the mother of one of Michael's high school classmates named Rico Solis. 17-year-old Rico also worked at an after-school job at Brown's Chicken, and worryingly, Evelyn hadn't heard from her son either. Rico worked the tills with Michael, and similar to Michael's family, you know, he, he'd emigrated to the States from the Philippines with his mother and two sisters a little over five years earlier, when he was 12. The tree now terrified parents, Michael's parents and Evelyn, decided it was best to call Palatine PD. Once again, Manny Castro returned to the restaurant, but this time he met with police officer Dan Bonneville at the scene. Despite Manny's insistence that something was just not right, Officer Bonneville and police in general didn't immediately jump to the worst case scenario. They went with the same initial presumption that the Castros had, that the workers had just decided to go out after work. Manny continued to press the police to look for Michael and the other workers, eventually deciding to file a missing persons report. Like that was the thing with the police. It was a, it was a very small town. Mm. So like it totally makes sense that the cops didn't like jump on this straight away. Uh, there was one longtime resident said Palatine was a place where doors went unlocked and personal safety was just taken at, for granted. Ooh, it always is. Always is. And then there was another person who said, uh, everyone knew everyone. Uh, you watched out for your neighbor's kids. Every kid had 10 moms on the block. So yeah, they were all looking at after a real tight knit, small yeah. community. So yeah, I don't think they thought there was anything untoward that mm. was happening. They, these are getting really, really weird, though. You have, like, now three people mm. who all worked in this small chicken shop in town that closed up at, like, nine. They'd be out by maybe half nine, ten after finishing up and cleaning up and everything. And now this is, you know, like, one, two a.m. And everybody's, mm. like, freaking out. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Pedro yeah. went there first, probably around one a.m. And then mm. um, Manny and every, everybody's worrying. Mm. So after filing the report and making things official, Castro returned to the restaurant once again, just after 3 a.m. This was not long after Pedro, too, too had been there. So a lot of people were showing up asking what was going on, but again, there was vehicles in the parking lot, but the building was all just shut up, just looked quiet, like it had closed like normal. This time, he was met by Officer Connolly, just like Pedro had, had already met him. And no sooner had the two of them begun a more thorough check of the premises when right away, Connolly found something not right. The side access door, specifically one reserved for staff use, was unlocked. If the restaurant had been closed down for the night as it appeared to be, there was simply no way the door should be unlocked. Connolly, tentatively, with his open palm rested on the grip of his service weapon, pushed the heavy door open and announced himself. After taking a couple of steps further inside, he came to a sudden and jarring stop when something far more concerning than an open door caught his eye. Propped up against the wall was a mop. A mop that was covered in the distinct reddish-brown stains that every experienced cop recognizes right away as dried blood. Then, from just over his shoulder, he heard Manny Castro's voice say, That's Michael's jacket. Manny tried to take a step forward, but Connolly stopped him, and taking a couple of nervous paces backwards, he backed the two of them out of the door. As he goes, the officer's eyes dart frantically around the room and are suddenly fixed on the walk-in freezer next to the entrance door. The door is being held open by a grisly doorstop. A human arm. Being sure to keep a hand on his gun, he used his free hand to raise his radio and, and call for backup. Within a couple of minutes, and I'm sure it must have felt like years to Officer Connolly and Manny Castro, Officer Kurt Saxma arrived, and the two of them, guns drawn, re-entered the restaurant. Yeah, that would, that would have been a hard wait. Not, not only thinking that possibly there's 
still the killer inside, but even what if one of the victims needs my help? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It could be somebody bleeding out there that a couple yeah. of seconds can make the difference. But opening that door, it sounds like they're looking at a horror movie, like blood yeah. on the mop and then yeah. a door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like like a shitty horror movie. Like You're the better door was held open by an arm. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, Jesus. Yeah, wait for backup. So knowing there is something very wrong, the officers were cautious, but also know that, as you said, someone may need help. They approached the freezer right away and see that Connolly had been right. There was an arm keeping the freezer door open. There was also a large pool of blood on the tiled floor. With Officer Saxma covering his back, Officer Conley opened the freezer door to the disturbing sight of five very clearly dead bodies stacked one on top of the other. Right then, Connolly and Saxma were joined by the senior officer on duty that night, Sergeant Bob Haas. Haas knew how big this was, and with five dead bodies in front of him, he called the deputy chief. Literally, during the space of that call, the death toll, it rose from five bodies to seven bodies. As Haas and the deputy chief were speaking, the other officers were continuing to search the scene when they opened the shop's walk-in fridge and discovered even more blood and another two bodies. The victims were all well beyond help. It was about as authentic of a massacre as anyone had ever seen. Along with 16-year-old Michael Castro, 17-year-old Rico Solis, and 47-year-old Guadalupe Maldonado were four more victims. Two more workers at the restaurant, Marcus Nelson, 31, and Thomas Menes, 32. The final two deceased were the husband and wife owners of this particular Brown's Chicken restaurant, 50-year-old Richard and 49-year-old Lynn Ellenfelt. Though the cause of their deaths wasn't immediately obvious, it was quickly determined that each of the dead had been shot multiple times, all except Lynn Ellenfelt, who had only been shot once, but also had her throat slit. She was also missing a key, which she usually wore on a bracelet, which was found shortly after, having been used to access the shop's safe. In total, based on the day's takings, just over $1,800 was missing. So that's seven dead, including two teenagers, for less than $2,000. Like, fuck. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. pennies. Like, they were. Like, for what it was. Jeez. It really was. Yeah, like, they were, yeah. like, the police, they were baffled at this stage as well. Yeah. Because it was such a low amount of money. Yes. Yeah. To be a high stakes robbery, mm-hmm. but then everyone seemed to be killed nearly like execution style. That's it. And at this at this point, they didn't know how many guns had been used, how many how many people, how many killers had been there. Yeah. So they they were yeah they had no idea what was happening. The level of violence was was so extraordinary. It didn't it didn't it just didn't compute. Uh, the possibility of the crime being much more personal had to be kept in mind. The irony of the killers hiding the bodies where where they did is that it was the best way to slow the degradation of evidence to keep it cold and undisturbed, which is exactly what the killers did. In the case of the Browns Chicken Massacre, is what this would later be known as, the perpetrators had inadvertently done the job for the forensic teams. This was right at the point when DNA was beginning to expand into criminal investigations. Though it wasn't being widely employed at the time, detectives were well aware that breakthroughs were happening constantly, and it wouldn't be long before they'd be able to access these new technologies. The state of the scene meant that unusually for investigators, they didn't need to rush to preserve the scene as much as usual. A large part of the job had been done for them. It also really helped that the crime had been committed just after the team had finished closing up for the night. Therefore, they would have cleaned up the scene. Authorities knew from the beginning that they had the possible timeline already narrowed down significantly, as Manny Castro and Pedro Maldonado's visits meant the killer must have already been gone by 11pm. A quick check of the shop's register later, and they had an even narrower window for when the crime must have taken place. Despite the restaurant closing at 9pm that evening, a four-piece chicken meal with a small drink that had been rung up at 9.08pm. The lateness of the order also indicated to investigators that whoever had placed the order was likely known to staff, maybe a regular, in order for them to even agree to fulfill the order. Usually, if somebody comes in, a, I remember when I worked in retail, if somebody came in, like, even five minutes before closing, I'd be like, fuck off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Close, sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then you get these people banging on the doors. Oh, this be just one thing. And then, I remember it used to happen all the time. You get people banging on the doors. Be like, no, we're closed. Just one thing. All right, fine. You let them in, and then they'd be there for, like, 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I remember there was one time when I was working in retail and it was at the end of the night so we closed the, the, the shutter down but we yeah. had it open maybe we were we still had to bring the bins out okay so it was like a couple of feet though. it was just a couple of feet so we get the bins and someone some customer like crawled underneath the door don't mind if and I do as he crawled he was like you guys open it's like no <laughs> <laughs> get out <laughs> I should have grabbed one thing <laughs> like crawling in yeah. Man, did you ever work in a food, fast food place? Um, no, not fast food. I worked in a, it was a chocolate shop. You did. You were mm. you were a little chocolate man. I was. Yeah, I worked in chocolate shop and a sweet shop. I remember you always lovingly talk about your job, though. You loved working with chocolate. I there was a lot of jobs I did that I hated. I've yeah. had like some a wild array of jobs, but the chocolate shop that's uh, that's one that yeah I always it's close to my heart. Yeah, I loved that. I had a great time. Was this in the one in Dublin or the one in Canada? Uh, this is one in Canada in Toronto. Oh yeah, it was, yeah, uh, yeah. It was great. Yeah, it was like a it. fancy chocolate shop. Yeah, it Wasn't was like it? yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was pretty fancy. Um, we had we had like a chocolate fountain, so that was pretty. Oh, cool. that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Did you have like marshmallows and strawberries and shit you dip it in or whatever. No, you couldn't. You could you couldn't eat out of it because oh, what that? Oh, it was pretty yeah. processed chocolate. Pretty well, you goodness. had to like to get it to flow. You had to mix in like a load of oil into the chocolate. Ugh. So it looked great, but but I'm sure it tasted like shit. Oh, you you wouldn't want to like I had like obviously I gave it a taste that worked there. But it, it, it was, it was, it was, it was pretty disgusting. But uh, yeah, you kind of had a free reign of any of your chocolates. You kind of, yeah, it's like, oh, I gotta write it off. Yeah. I'll, I'll eat it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, write it off in my belly. But uh, yeah, like, but this case as well, it's really I was like just coming back off that tangent. It's it's really good example this case of how technology and better crime scene management uh, really made a huge difference to solving crimes. Um, like before, back in the day, invest, like investigators, they relied heavily on talking to witnesses and suspects or using informants and undercover work. And then if those avenues didn't pan out, then the cases, they just like stayed unsolved. Right. But like nowadays, like a lot of cases, they get cracked, not just through like fancy lab work, but paying attention to every single detail at the crime scene. And that's exactly what the forensic team did in this case. Like they really, they took their time, as you said, like they, they had the time to do it. So they took serious advantage of that. They took their time and made sure to document every single thing at that crime scene. Which we will see, it was mm. absolutely crucial to uh, solve in the case eventually. Yeah, yeah, like we said, yeah, the fact that the murders were committed after they closed up, so the place was cleaned, like, mm. by the staff, so yeah. there wasn't going to be shit everywhere, it'd make gathering evidence a lot easier, because mm. yeah, yeah. there wasn't trash everywhere. And then the fact that the front bodies were frozen, yeah, it's an interesting, this is a, this is a wild one, mm. especially when we get to the perpetrators. Oh, yeah. So, by 4am on the 9th of January, less than six hours after the crime had been committed, the scene was surrounded by firemen, EMTs, and representatives of various law enforcement agencies. The Palatine police chief himself was on his way and was being followed to the scene by every officer they could get a hold of. The authorities weren't stupid. They knew they needed to act quickly, and almost as importantly, they needed to make sure they were seen to be acting. The FBI and a whole team of specialist grief counselors from Northwest Community Hospital were also called on for the, well, unimaginable pain the families would have been going through. Yeah, they were really, they're like, they were on it mm. right, right away. Like they, they, as soon as they found the bodies, they made sure to secure the restaurant and the parking lot. They even kept police and detectives out until they were done gathering the evidence and everyone going, or anyone going inside, they had to wear disposable gloves yeah. and foot covers and the forensic team, like, they didn't waste any time. They dusted for fingerprints, measured for blood spatter, took swabs, mm. snapped photographs of the bodies. They collected almost 100 fingerprints plus hair, fibers, blood and bullets. So, yeah, yeah they didn't waste like, any time it's, getting it's straight It's pretty interesting, in. this story, because oftentimes in stories we do talk about how the police fucked up or like the police didn't do a mm. proper job securing the scene and that kind of stuff. This is an interesting case where the police actually did everything really, really well. They did. They did yeah. a great job. Yeah. But they still only caught the perpetrators kind of by luck. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Where as we'll we'll get to it. But yeah. it's really interesting. Is that like you can do everything right, gather every single piece of evidence, yeah. and it can still it's like we'll get to it later. Yeah, but yeah. anyway. So that same morning, just hours after the crime scene was discovered, police carried out an arrest of a 23-year-old ex-employee named Martin E. Blake. They also executed a search warrant at the man's home. An ex-employee would make sense. Not only would he know where the fuse box was to cut off the power so as not to draw attention, but he also had allegedly threatened violence and vengeance after being dismissed from his role at the chicken shop. How many people are going <laughs> to threaten vengeance at my minimum wage? <laughs> I, job I will have my vengeance! In the uh, fast food. Most people would probably be grateful after getting fired. He also owned a 22 pistol, which he was known to like to shoot inside his own home. There was also a link to Michael Castro, 16-year-old victim Michael Castro. Martin had briefly dated Michael's sister, Mary Jane. Though he seemed very promising in the 
kind of worst way, apparently acting cocky and like he knew something during interviews, Martin would rather quickly and also unfortunately be ruled out after being held and interrogated for two days. Over the coming days and weeks, more than 300 people, including multiple ex-employees, were called in for questioning, but one by one, they were dropped from the investigation. That guy's having to take a shit, didn't he? Yeah, he sounds like a fucking idiot. <laughs> Who fires a gun in their own house? That's, it's your house. Uh, I know, for fun though. Yeah. Maybe his house is a shit also. Yeah. On January 11th, more than two days after the crime, Dr. Jane Homeyer was working at the scene when she noticed something in a trash can. It was the remnants of what appeared to be a four-piece chicken meal. The same meal that had been ordered after closing on the day of the murders. Something about the scraps having been thrown in an otherwise pristine waste bin. Clearly, the bin had already been, you know, cleared and prepped for the next morning's service when the, when the meal had been discarded. Dr. Homar bagged and tagged the chicken as potential evidence, and despite what must have looked like insanity to some of her colleagues, she had it frozen just in case it might be a future use, and it makes sense to do that. If the killer had ordered it, which likely it was high that it was the killer, as they yeah. were the last people there, mm. that would have their evidence on it. Yeah. Crawling in under the shutter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It <laughs> 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 It's almost impossible to explain just how much of an inspired piece of detective work the decision to save the food scraps was. At the time, it was literally trash, but in time, it would turn out to be the most vital piece of physical evidence in the entire case. There's simply no way that it could be of any use at the time with technology as it was. But decades later, that single piece of evidence would go on to make more people happy than any frozen chicken had before it. Dr. Jane Homer, she really made a huge impact on this investigation. Like, she, she was an amazing scientist. She started out studying forensics and handwriting and then moved up to run the Highland Park Crime Lab and then eventually she ended up as the director at the forensic training unit at the FBI Academy in Quantico wow. in Virginia. But yeah, back back then, like DNA analysis, it was still, as you're saying, like still pretty much new, but she saw it, the potential that it had down the line. She thought that with advancements in the field, they might be able to analyze the future, as you're saying. But or, like her thinking at the time was maybe we have like improvements in like a bite mark technology mm. uh, and then maybe even like get DNA from dried saliva <laughs> uh, <laughs> off the chicken bones. Uh, yeah, and she t- like, yeah, she generally thought like these would be the, the key to cracking the case. Mm. It must be like so hard back then to be like, this is the key, but we just, we're not there yet. Oh, you know? this is frustrating. <laughs> yeah. I can see it from here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So investigators were far from short on evidence. In addition to the half-eaten chicken, they also found a shoe imprint in the freshly cleaned floor. Again, the fact that the the staff had actually cleaned up and mopped the place after closing up for the day helped the police because if there's shoe prints there, it can only have come from these certain amount of people. It was later determined to be a men's Nike Air Force One, size 12 to 40, not widely worn as it was only manufactured for two years between 1990 and 1992. That told investigators they're looking for at least one tall man between six foot and six foot six. Though they didn't have any shells, they did have the slugs removed from the victims and several from the walls. All of the slugs were 38s. They even tested to see if it was possible for anyone passing by to have heard anything. Brown's is just across the street from a shopping mall. But they found by firing a 38 and a 9mm into a vest and a freezer that it was impossible to hear anything from inside the restaurant. A total of 21 rounds had been fired. What's really disturbing is that the murder weapon was a 38 caliber revolver which holds only 6 rounds. That meant that the murderer had to stop and reload the gun three times, after which the shooter had either pocketed the casings right away or they had to walk around and pick up every spent shell. That's fucked. Yeah. As well as Lynn Ellen Felt having her throat cut, Michael Castro also suffered a deep stab wound. Despite the heaving bag of evidence, plus the usual inundation of tips from psychics and every nutcase in town, the case slowly grew colder and colder. Yeah, I think it was about like, I think in all about 15,000. Tips that came well, in. Yeah, really? huge amount of tips. Yeah. The restaurant closed down pretty soon after. No one wanted to eat there for obvious reasons. But even when a dry cleaners took over the place, still no one came. Yeah, nobody wanted to set foot in that place. It wasn't until the building was demolished that the site got a new start with a bank being built on the former Brown's chicken plot. The bank's got to be haunted, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It didn't just affect that specific branch either, it pretty much ruined the national franchise. The damage to the reputation was that bad. 
When people heard of the lack of cameras and security at the restaurant, it was, it was almost as if the public blamed the franchise itself. Maybe if the actual killers had been caught more quickly, the damage wouldn't have been quite so severe. And you know what? There's only one thing that can help brands shaken this reputation now. <laughs> Sponsoring the That Chapter <laughs> podcast. <laughs> we'll get you back, guys. <laughs> yeah. uh, ultimately, the chain went from having more than 300 locations across the US to today with only 20 branches. These days, all localized in the Chicago area. There is currently one in Palatine today, but it's not in the same location, obviously. But yeah, it went from 300 to 20. Jeez, that's crazy. The case gone cold, it wasn't for lack of trying. Like, it just kind of gone back to what we said before, but uh, with how well the police done. But, like, just three days after finding the bodies, the Palatine police chief, he, he like, he made the right move by putting together the Palatine task force. And it was a big crew, 75 strong, made up of local um, and state cops, along with some FBI folks. Like, sometimes egos can get in the way in these sorts of things uh, when they try to bring in outside help, but... Like, they knew that they needed, um, and they were out of depth, so they really, they welcomed the assistance. But as time started to pass on, they still hadn't cracked the case. That's when the blame game started. Mm. And everyone started pointing fingers at each other. Uh, cops, politicians, and Brown's chicken franchise itself, which, which you mentioned. Like, yeah, you're saying that, like, public, they were quick to blame the franchise. But the public, they also started pointing fingers at the police, saying that they were just in over their heads with inexperienced officers. Um, there was the Better Government Association, so the BGA. They even set up a panel to look into the investigation. Their their goal, it wasn't on solving the case, but it was more to get answers on whether appropriate resources were deployed. Basically, they were just there to, like, just to criticise. Mm-hmm. But um, they reported that the police, they messed up by not securing the crime scene properly, not checking the surrounding area, uh, having messed up the crime lab, which resulted in evidence getting lost. But a few years later on, another group of experts from the Illinois State Crime Commission said that the Palatine Police and Brown chicken task force they did their job right they followed every lead yeah. and went through the investigation like yeah. they really did uh, they said that the BGA's report wasn't based on facts and like 95% of that report was baseless Yeah, um, like all this blame game it went on for a while uh, but by the time all was said and done there were like reports on top of reports panels on top of panels all the while the killers were just still out there just walking yeah. free in fact, nine long years passed from the night of the murders, and there had been no progress, but that is, until police received a phone call in 2002 that would blow the whole case wide open and finally give investigators a name to chase down. The call was from a woman named Anne Lockett, and she told officers that on the night of the murders, literally within a few hours, her boyfriend at the time, James, had called her up and told her, quote, Watch the news tonight. I did something. No sooner had they received the call and looked at the James in question and the detectives had a car heading over to pick up one James Degorski. Yeah, real Chicagoan. <laughs> That's poor Canadian. Is it? Well, that, I don't know. I can't, I can't really do a Chicago accent. But I, I, can't, I can't think what a Chicago accent is. I don't is. know. I just know because he has a Polish surname that's very Chicagoan. Oh, okay. He has a lot of yeah. Poles in yeah, yeah. Chicago. It's like New York is like Italian, Boston's Irish. Right, and yeah, Chicago yeah. is like full, yeah. full Poles. Right, right, yeah. I but, guess. Yeah, well, it's better than my accent. Like, I can't not do accents. Like, <laughs> I can, I, no, I can always try and do accents and they sound great up here. <laughs> but, uh, the comment section is, is not as kind as my inner voice. <laughs> So Anne Lockett's claims were obviously a little shaky, as nearly 10 years, it's a long time to have passed since that night. Fortunately, police had a second witness named Eileen Bacala. Eileen told police, and would later go on to testify, that on the night of the murders, she had picked up Degorski and a friend of his named Juan Luna. Luna was only 18 years old when the massacre happened. After she finished her shift, at a pizza shop. Eileen had gone and, and picked them up, taking them to get high, and at the same time, they had been counting out a large amount of cash. She got $50 to, to keep quiet about the money, but she remembered the rest being about $1,800 in total. A few hours later, on the way to drop Luna off at his own car, Eileen claimed that Degorski had asked her to drive past Brown's chicken store. And when she did, there was ambulances, there was police, there was fire trucks, so you know what was there, a lot of stuff was there. What she can't have known, though, is that the crowd that had gathered outside the restaurant was, was largely made up of relatives of the dead still inside, including Michael Castro's and Rico Solis' parents, and Pedro, Juana, and Beatrice Maldonado, just hoping to see their family members. Eileen said the robbery was incidental. 
the pair's real intention was just to kill someone. And it didn't matter that Juan Luna knew the people inside the restaurant. They just wanted to feel what it was like to kill. Reading about James Eric Degorski, it seems pretty much everyone who knows him would, would warn you away from him. Degorski was nothing but trouble and not in a cool bad boy popped collar kind of way. Not like us. Not like us, yeah. exactly. We are, we are like, I'm slicking back my eyebrows at the record show. Cool. <laughs> yeah. We're bad boys. Don't mess with us. Even before the murders, he had a history of run-ins with the law. Three years earlier, in 1990, Degorski and his pals had broken into a trailer belonging to a construction company. Degorski was 17 years old at the time, and the real serious crime took place after he had left. His friends thought it would be really funny to torch the place. Otherwise, he likely would have gotten a much more severe sentence than the year's supervision he got if he had stuck around. Safe to say he didn't learn anything from that slap in the wrist, as less than a year later he was pulled over riding in a stolen car with a friend. Degorski's behavior showed a worrying escalation in the wrong direction when, around eight months before he and Juan Luna would go on to commit a bona fide atrocity, he decided to have a bit of practice and tied up his then girlfriend, who he promptly bet the shite out of for daring to try and break up with him. He was convicted for that, but narrowly escaped a custodial sentence in favor of probation. Yeah, he, was real asshole. he was also arrested for marijuana possession, driving under the influence of alcohol and several traffic violations as well. He does sound like a bad boy. He is a bad boy. <laughs> he is cool. He sounds cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me rewrite the script. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a, but it's weird in comparison that Juan Luca, he was, he was never on the police radar. Mm. Uh, like he seemed to keep his nose clean from, well, obviously apart from this, but I, I think he had like an instant way to check after the murders, like years down the line before mm. he was eventually arrested. But like, yeah, like he'd no runs in, yeah. in the police at all. Mm -hmm. So despite Degorski being the, uh, yeah, as we said, more established criminal, it was the 18-year-old Juan Luna who had the connection to Brown's Chicken. Juan had, had briefly worked there as a cashier, the same role as Michael Castro and Rico Solis. Anne Lockett later told police that Degorski and Luna had met in high school. Luna had got the job at Brown's through the school's vocational training program. Luna and Degorski's friendship began like a lot of teenage friendships, hanging out, killing time, and smoking weed, but it wasn't long before their relationship went to much, much darker places. In one interview, Anne Lockett told investigators that the two liked to torture and kill stray cats and other small, vulnerable animals they found around the neighborhood. According to Lockett, Degorski told her that it was Luna who had suggested he wanted to do more than kill animals. He wanted to know what it was like to kill a human being. Somehow, over time, that idle chatter would become a full-blown plan. Now, what is amazing to this is he wanted to know what it was like to kill a human being, mm. which is, I, that's something, again, that kind of comes up in a lot of serial killers or wannabe serial killers. Mm. His idea to planning on killing a human being was to start out with seven. Yeah, yeah. In a massacre. Yeah, rather yeah. than just like killing a, a lonely person or yeah, somebody yeah. nobody will, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. what the fuck? You went from zero to atrocity. I like, he was like, go hard to go home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Asshole. Uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's weird as well, because like generally with uh, two two people that go on these mass kill, killing sprees, there's one like dominant personality type. Yeah. Contrasted with more of a submissive and compliant personality type. The dominant person, like, they'll always, they're always the one making the plans yeah. and calling the shots while the submissive partner is just there, like, to please the dominant person. But in this case, though, it seems like they're both as bad as each other. Mm. Like, they're yeah. both out there, about killing animals. It was, it sounds like the Gorski is definitely, like, he's an asshole. Yeah. Um, but then Luna's like, oh, what if I like to kill someone? Yeah, you know? he's like the quiet serial killer while the Gorski is like the loud guy who goes around shooting up shit. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah It's like yeah. the and such types of serial killers yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, it's very weird. So uh, Juan Luna knew that Browns had a shitty security. He also knew there was no cameras, no alarm systems, and the owners weren't the types to keep a shotgun behind the counter. They'd get little resistance. So between Anne Lockett, Eileen Bacala, and a later confession by Juan Luna, investigators were able to eventually piece together a fairly complete timeline of the events of Friday 8th, January 1993. The whole thing had been planned out and executed methodically. The soon-to-be mass murderers purposely dressed in old clothes and shoes. Degorski was the one wearing the Nike Air Force Ones. He's six foot tall. They wore up clothes they wouldn't, they wouldn't miss. They knew they were going to have to ditch what they were wearing. So prior to going inside, and this is like, this really freaked me out when I was reading this up, mm -hmm. is that 
Before they went inside, Wana Luna used a piece of wood that he jammed under the employee-only side entrance, cutting off any chance of the victims making an escape, which is absolutely horrific yeah, yeah. to think about. Yeah, it was well thought out. It was, it was a bit methodical. Like. The fact that they were just like, we're not even going to let them make a run for it. Like, yeah, geez. Yeah, yeah. Like they, they had an angle. They knew, yeah. they knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah, they just trapped them in there. Yeah. Then, right as the staff were beginning to clean up and close down for the night, they headed inside. And Luna placed the order for the four-piece chicken meal, let in and allowed to because he had used to work there. They were like foxes in the hen house and the chickens had no idea what was coming. Luna, he, like, he obviously ordered these meals, uh, or the, the four-piece chicken meal, so they could stay uh, after closing without arousing suspicion. However, Degorski, he was actually pissed off about this because he's, he, his thinking was that the chicken was greasy and he thought that their fingerprints would make it more obvious. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, like, as we were saying, like, these guys, they really did their best to cover their tracks as much as possible. Even before entering the restaurant, they walked in a deliberately erratic way in an effort to, like, disguise the pattern in which they walked. And then also, when they left the restaurant, they stepped in their own shoe prints in the snow, again, to further try and cover uh, up right, the yeah. beaner. But, uh, yeah, just, like, real, like, bear, bear grill shit, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there are varying versions of what happened next and actually kicked off the massacre inside inside the restaurant. Lockett told police that Degorski said that one of the staff had tried to fight them off, maybe Guadalupe Maldonado, as the county coroner found a cut on his arm during the autopsy, so maybe he'd gone into a fist, he comes with him. And the, the shooting started when one of them made a dash for the back door that Luna had already jammed shut. While Degorski and Luna both separately describe the situation as a robbery gone wrong, the truth is far from that. The two went in prepared to kill. After all, why take so many rounds with you for a simple robbery? Why try and close the back door if it's a simple robbery? Let alone the fact that they fired so many times. Luna says he was just trying to frighten Lynn Ellen Feltz into giving up the safe keys, something her daughter says she would have done instantly and without a fight, but Luna says she resisted, and in the commotion, he accidentally cut her throat. Though he also says in his confession that he called her bitch, so, hell, just how that adds up being accidental is a little more than fishy. Prosecutors say he was just looking for any excuse to start the killing, and whether she was too slow, too fast, or any little thing he could have picked up on, she and everyone else in the restaurant was doomed from the moment Luna and Degorski walked through the door. The two victims whose bodies were found in the cooler were most likely the first two killed, followed by the other five being ordered into the walk-in freezer where Luna and Degorski fired, emptying cylinder after cylinder into to the crowd. There was, there was nowhere to run and no place to hide. Yeah, I'm not buying for a second that... It was a robbery gone wrong. Yeah, like, I, no. I, don't, I, don't, I don't even think they wore masks. Mm. So even if the plan was just to rob the place and leave, he'd, he'd worked there before. Yeah. So they right. knew him. So he was, exactly. never, he was never going to get away with it. Like, Yeah, yeah. He had to kill him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah like he had, he had a plan. He was sticking with it and they were, they, they were there to kill. Yeah. In his confession, Juan Luna claimed he didn't know whether he hit any of the five people inside. But I mean, come on, it's not a very big freezer. It's impossible for him not to have known what he did. That and how many times he reloaded the pistol showed just what his intention was. All of the victims were hit in the head. 17-year-old Rico Solis, three times. Maldonado, Nelson, and Michael Castro were each hit twice. And Lynn, Ellen felt once. Each of them also had wounds to their hands and arms, clear defensive wounds from desperately trying to protect themselves and each other. A key detail, withheld from the press and the public, was that one of the victims had vomited while they lay dying. This was unknown to anyone but the police and CSI guys. Yet Anne Lockett was able to accurately relay this detail to police as it had been described to her by James Degorski. Despite the defense counsel trying to discredit Anne, using her addictions and mental health struggles, this small detail gave huge credence to her account and helped to substantiate her claims that Degorski had confessed to her. When Menace's body was found, he had $90 hidden in his sock, probably put there when he heard the commotion and thought it was a simple robbery. Richard Ellenfeld also took the few seconds he had to hide his credit card in a box in the cooler. It wasn't hard to find, and had the motive really been robbery, well, it's likely they would have found it. Richard Ellenfeld and Tom Menes were the two found in the cooler. 
Ellenfeld had been shot five times in the shoulder, back and head. Menes was hit three times, and Gorski claimed responsibility in his confession. There was no panic after the crime. The two had used the store's own mop to wipe up the more obvious blood, and had turned out all the lights except one, exactly as things should be if the restaurant was prepared to be opened the very next morning. A few hours later, and a proud Degorski made that fateful call to Anne Lockett, who was in Forest Hospital, a private psychiatric and substance abuse hospital, and that's when he said, watch the news tonight. Lockett, she was only 17 at the time, and she'd gone through her fifth suicide attempt. Wow. Which geez. is why she was in the psychiatric hospital at the time. But it just goes to show, like, you know, what a, what a top-notch boyfriend. Yeah. The Degorski was calling Real up good. his already very troubled girlfriend, bragging about killing people, and then telling her, if she tells anyone, He's going to kill her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Juan Luna, he was actually one of the uh, 300 original interviewees in the early days after the killings. Anne Lockett had attended the interview with him and said it lasted less than 30 minutes total. And at no time did she think that they suspected Luna. Everything was very cordial and by the book, like they were just going through the motions. Of course, he, he told Lockett to go with Luna to the police interview in order to make him seem more legitimate. He also told them both to dress nice mm. so that the police wouldn't suspect them. So Luna, he ended up wearing black pants and a trench coat, <laughs> which I would argue <laughs> that makes is you look the most more like suspicious <laughs> outfit to wear. Yeah, definitely was covered up. Good old school shooter look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Juan Luna went on trial first on May 10th, 2007. He was charged with and ultimately found guilty on seven counts of first-degree murder. The death penalty was expected only for the jury to not agree unanimously. It was 11 in favor, with one holding out against. Narrowly escaping a one-way trip to the Needle Factory, he was ultimately given life in prison without the possibility of parole on October 20th, 2009. Luna's defense team, they did their best to prove that her client was innocent. So when Eileen Bacala took the stand to testify how Luna bragged to her about the killings, Luna's lawyer tried to go after her credibility, saying she wasn't remembering properly because she had smoked marijuana. <sighs> the lawyer said, so this is a quote from what he said, As you sit here today, you don't remember one word of what came out of the lips of Juan Luca, do you? When you smoke that reefer, it gets you high and you see and hear things, don't you? This is a man that has clearly never touched a drug in his life. Yeah. The, the prosecution, they played the dramatic 44-minute videotape showing Luna calmly admitting to committing the murders with Degorski and then describing the gruesome details involved. The videos showed him telling police about the chicken meal he'd ordered, forcing seven victims to lie down on the floor before herding them into a freezer to be shot and also slitting Lynn Ellenfeld's throat. In rebuttal, the defense said that Luna's confession occurred after 19 hours of questioning and he missed his family. (sighs) The defense team, they tried everything. They attempted to divert attention away from Juan Luna as a murderer by insisting someone else was responsible. They put forward a fingerprint that did not match Luna's, which was on a green service tray on top of a garbage container. Unfortunately for the defense, this also happened to be the same container where they found the chicken meal and napkin which contained Luna's DNA and left Mm. palm print. Speaking of DNA, the defense stated that the chicken bone with Luna's DNA on it did not prove that he committed the murder. They brought in an expert who stated that the DNA profile on the meal could also appear in one million other people in the United States. Ooh. So to counter this, the prosecution, they brought in Ranjit Chukravuti, who helped develop the national DNA database used by law enforcement. He said that any person off the street would have a 99.9999% chance of being excluded as a match to the DNA in the chicken sample. So there really was like no argument with this. Yeah. And in the end of prosecution, they just had an overwhelming amount of evidence to convict them. Luna's defense team, they were kind of like, you know, like Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, what are the chances as DNA doesn't match my clients? 100? Eh, more like one in a million. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And as for uh, James Degorski, his trial took place in 2009, ending with a guilty verdict. As a result of the guilty verdict, he faced the death penalty, but many, including a significant number of the deceased's family members, actively campaigned against the death sentence and instead thought a life sentence was more appropriate, reasoning, why should he get a quick death? They should have to live what they did for the rest of their unnatural lives. Degorski maintains his innocence all these years later from behind bars with multiple appeals and even a website dedicated to trying to have his sentence overturned. 
they've so far been unsuccessful. And unless he can pull a rabbit out of a hat and that rabbit happens to be holding a magical exonerating piece of evidence, he's going to die in prison. A little low light, depending on your perspective, is that Degorski was splashed across the headlines once more in 2014 when he received a settlement for $451,000, later reduced by a couple hundred grand, for an incident in Cook County Jail in May 2002, in which Degorski was beaten by a sheriff's deputy so badly that he suffered facial fractures and even needed surgery to fix. The deputy was obviously let go. Bring him back, bring him back. <laughs> the state had launched a campaign to have the money confiscated and put towards Tagorski's upkeep in jail. However, some have said that it should be given to the families of his victims. But so far, they all seem to not want to touch it. I think it should be given to the families or at least mm. maybe some kind of memorial. Or, it yeah. shouldn't be fucking given to James Gorsk anyway. No, or like a charity or, so, or something. Yeah, you know? exactly. Charity would be good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so ends the story of the Browns chicken massacre with both the perpetrators rotting in prison to this day one little thing that initially annoyed me with the case was why it took Anne Lockett so long to come forward like for nine years she just seemed to go on living her life yeah I wonder why she, why did she even come forward like was what happened in her life that she she just couldn't hold it in anymore that was it yeah like she said initially it was because she was scared of the Gorski and uh, Juan and Juan Luna like she was terrified that they'd come after her and it was just I guess this was just weighing on her and eventually she was like I have to tell somebody um, however I, I did hear an interesting take on it from someone that said if Lockett had to come forward before 1998 when DNA testing had become so sophisticated enough to isolate a profile from saliva it might have been a very different ending Mm -hmm. after all like this was the key bit of evidence that managed to remove any reasonable doubt in the jury's mind so if it had been before 1998 they they could end up walking so I guess it's kind of one of those like you know blessing in disguise silver lining that it actually took her nine nine years to uh, to finally come out well, what I will say is, get this, I actually think I know why she did come out when she did. Okay, go on Because I'm on jamesdegorski.com, and he claims, right, that she... <laughs> oh, yeah, this is what he says. <laughs> this is what he says, which is the truth. I think we could all... We, we already agree James Degorski is cool, <laughs> so we can believe what he says. So he says, Anne wanted the reward money. She used uh, to lie to me. She used uh, me to get things prestige, and then hated him for breaking it off with her. So that's why she went to the police and lied about him, uh, yeah. he says. Um, and uh, so there you go. Uh, do you want me to actually read uh, read uh, a bit more about this? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, jamesdegorski.com. Story untold. I am innocent! Exclamation <laughs> mark. Jim Degorski, I am innocent. I was framed by my greedy so-called friends. If this can happen to me... It can happen to anybody. Anybody could walk into a chicken shop and murder seven people. It could happen to you, Keith. You could do it. Not just any chicken shop, Mike. Brown's, Brown's chicken. chicken shop. Available only in 20 locations in the Chicago, Illinois area. Who am I? My name is James Degorski. I'm currently wrongfully incarcerated at Illinois Stateville Correctional Center after being wrongfully convicted of the multiple murders that took place at Brown's Chicken Restaurant in Palatine, Illinois on January 8, 1993. I've been fighting to prove my innocence ever since my illegal arrest, which occurred at 3.30 p.m. on May 16, 2002. After 19 years of slowly going in circles, I'm finally taking my case to the World Wide Web's Court of Public Opinion. You! I'm reading this out word for word, by the way. That's literally what it says. Now I can finally tell my story. Uh, and then, so, he basically then has a bullet point, concealed evidence to keep the truth from being heard. Um, I feel like we shouldn't help him get his word out. <laughs> yeah, and I, well, hey, yeah, that's yeah, fun. Yeah. We're laughing at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is, he says there, there's two DNA samples found at the scene. One belonged to Juan Luna. The other is that of an unknown person. So, not his DNA, he says, because I wasn't there. Um, I don't even like chicken. I had no personal motive, as I didn't need money. I sold marijuana and worked full time. I had plenty of money. The, like the fucking robbery, we've already the robbery's not the motive ever. I had no personal issues with the people who worked there, but Juan Luna did. He had worked there and always needed money. He had motive. So essentially, he's just saying, yeah, it's Juan Luna and probably some other guy who did it. But um, old uh, freaking what's his face? 
this cocksucker uh, was framed. So yeah, well, there you go, James Stigorski. Uh, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna call bullshit on that one. <laughs> exactly. And there you go. So, Shanae, that Shanae. is the story of the Browns chicken massacre. It's a pretty grim one. There's a good quote from, um, so at the end of the trial, Emmanuel Castro, the father of one of the victims, said, if given the chance to go to heaven or hell, he would choose hell. So he could follow Jim Degorski and Juan Luna around for all eternity and torment them forever. Wow, that's pretty badass. It is, isn't it? Like, is I've never good. rooted for someone innocent so much to go to hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so he can torture these killers yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, here, listen, folks. That's uh, that's this whole episode. That's it. Uh, definitely a grim story. But, um, right. Thank you so much for listening to me and Keith Yamaran about the Browns Chicken Massacre. Hope you enjoyed this whole episode. And always remember, new episode of the That Chapter podcast is out every Monday uh, on all podcast platforms. So wherever you get your podcasts. And please tune in and, you know, just go on That Chapter and just, uh, you know. Give it a go. Give it a go. That's it. Keith. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's yours. <laughs> yeah, I know. Never do that again. <laughs> you uh, owe me money now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. See you. All right. Bye, guys. Despite the restaurant closing at 9 p.m. that evening, a four-piece chicken meal with a smaller drink for the low, low price of, I don't know, six dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Brands Chicken, we are over sponsorships. Yeah, yeah. Of our we're really advertising. <laughs> hey, listen, they're listening and I know they are. Yeah.